Hello and welcome to Keenan Keys. Here I have the Cassiotone CT410V, the larger version of the MT400V, which I showed you in one of my previous videos. Now, this will be a pure repair video. I will take it apart and clean it as usual, fix a few things, but I will try to show everything in a little more detail. Of course, you will hear some music made with the CT410V in the background. But since this model is functionally and sound-wise identical to the MT400V, there's no need to show everything again. We also have 49 but large keys, 8 note polyphony, 20 tones, 12 rhythms, vibrato, sustain, reverb and a stereo chorus, the filter control, bass and chord variations, separate volume controls for all accompaniment parts, headphone and line outputs and a pitch control. The only differences are the two inputs for sustain and volume pedals, the built-in speakers and of course the size and the weight. It's more than twice as heavy. The jack for the breath controller is at the front. It was also released in 1984. It's a bit harder to find on the used market than the MT400V, but usually sells for about the same price of around 100 euros. For a long time, these two models were the only models with a V in the name. But by the time I was shooting the MT400V video, Casio released a new model, the CTS1000V. However, it has nothing to do with the older models. It has a special vocal synthesizer. And I really don't know why they picked the V for the name. I think this will confuse the customer. Because, as we all know, V stands for filter. This unit is technically fully functional. Except for the sliders, which are a bit scratchy. But obviously, a key is broken. It's still working, but it doesn't stay down. It's almost impossible to find spare parts. But chances are good that the broken parts are still there. Because I can hear something rattling around inside. And there's a large crack in the housing. I assume it once fell to the ground. I will try to fix that too. And of course I will clean it. To take it completely apart, we have to remove the slider caps first. If you can't pull them off by hand, use a piece of plastic instead of a screwdriver or something else made of metal. This one is made of an old credit card. So you don't risk to scratch the housing or the slider caps. I will leave the buttons on. These are easier to take off later. You should put a towel or something like these pads underneath it. Fortunately, the bottom piece isn't broken as well. Sometimes there are screws hiding in the battery compartment, but not this time. I recommend to keep everything organized. This will pay out when it comes to reassembly. Now comes the moment to lift the bottom piece. If we are lucky, there's nothing attached to it. But most often, it is at least connected to the battery compartment. Also this time. This is the main bolt. It looks the same as in the MT400V. Here is the NEC D930G accompaniment chip. And it also has the little holes to access the trim parts. This is the amplifier board. This is the filter board, and below that are at least three other boards for sliders and switches. This one is for the breath controller input. And of course we have the board with the key contacts. The bottom piece has no date stamp. I guess Casio started using date stamps only in 1985. This model is from 1984. In later models you may find one like this which tells you the year and the month of production. But more often, the date stamp will look like this. The last mark shows when the part was produced, and the first mark shows when the production started. This is of course not the release date, but usually very close to it. Here's already a part of the broken key. Hopefully I find some more. One screw is stuck to the speaker. I wonder how it could come loose and where it's missing. As with all early Casio keyboards, the connections between the boards are soldered. But as the lazy guy that I am, I'm only going to desolder the connection to the battery compartment. This is the cheapest soldering iron I could find that has a temperature control. Certainly no professional equipment, but it will do the job. I set the temperature to 400 degrees Celsius. Now I will unscrew all circuit boards. Here a screw is missing. This has to be the one that was stuck to the speaker. A lot of screws. 
When things get a little more complex, it's better to take a few pictures. This makes it easier to put everything back together afterwards. It looks like there's a bit more damage than I expected. It's a bit tricky to remove all boards at the same time. You have to be very careful not to damage the connections. The switches. And finally the keypad. This is really heavy. A couple of brackets for the keys are also broken. The top piece is ready for cleaning. There's a plastic strip glued to the metal. I have to remove it to take off the keys. Maybe I will clean it and put it back on later, but I don't think it's really necessary. Every key has a little spring that has to be detached first. I use dish liquid to clean the top piece and the keys. Be careful when you clean it from the inside. There might be a few small pins that break off easily. Now I have to pick the right glue. I have used this one in the past, but I don't like it. It's not easy to handle and it smells awful. I bought two other glues. This is an all-purpose adhesive and it's said to hold four tons of weight. But I also found this special plastic glue. I haven't used it before, but it seems to be the right choice. These are all parts I found inside. This seems to be a part of the housing. The other parts are from two damaged keys. This is the key that doesn't stay down. I will have to glue these small parts first. I let it dry for a few minutes. In the meantime, I fix the other key. There's only a small piece broken up at the end. Back to the first key. This fits perfectly. The other piece has now dried for 10 minutes and should be ready for the final step. There's actually a third key that's damaged, but the missing piece of this one is gone. However, it will also work with one hook. Now the brackets. Seven of them are broken. And finally, the big crack. I try not to get too much glue on the outside. Now it has to dry for 24 hours. In the meantime, we can take care of the other components. This is the amplifier board with a stereo chorus. I think I didn't praise the chorus enough in my MT400V video. It makes a big difference and expands the sound possibilities a lot. The MN3209 is a BBD chip. I guess it's similar to the MN3009 in the Juno 60. 
but it's a low voltage device. The MN3102 below is the clock generator and the 4558 is a stereo preamplifier. This is a stereo chorus with only one delay line. A mix of effect and dry signal is sent to both outputs, but one effect signal is phase inverted. This means the effect signal is gone if you convert the stereo signal to mono. If you want to know a bit more about how a chorus works, I recommend to check out my June 60 review. Here we have the volume controls, the filter controls and the board for the switches. Now it's easier to remove the buttons. The mainboard seems to be identical to the one in the MT400V. We have the trim parts for the drums and for the filter. Under this piece of foam is the NEC D931 sound chip for the main bars. If you like to modify your CT410V, I recommend to have a look at the Table Hooter website. There you can find detailed information about all possible modifications. I put a link in the description. A few capacitors have white spots. I don't know if this is a bad sign and if they should be replaced soon. Everything is working fine for now. The green stuff underneath seems to be glue. It has been used in some other places as well. Before I start cleaning the contacts, I will have to take care of the foam. I try to remove most of it with a vacuum cleaner. There's far too much foam to remove everything. And most of it is on the ribbon cables. And I don't want to risk damaging the connections. The sliders need some contact spray. First, I remove some dirt with compressed air. Then I will give them some contact spray. This spray is an all-in-one solution. No follow-up treatment required. This is the easiest way to get the sliders working again, but usually not a permanent solution. For a more thorough cleaning, you would have to desolder the sliders and take them apart. But they were just scratching a bit, so I guess this will be enough for now. To clean the contacts, I use isopropanol alcohol. But just a little bit. I also use isopropanol alcohol to remove the adhesive residue. The black keys have to be inserted first. Just in case, I put the repaired keys in the top octave. Usually I put some grease to where the keys touch the housing. I use a very thick multi-purpose grease for that. I bought it about 15 years ago and the color changed and it became even thicker since then. In this case I don't need it because of the felt strips. And I don't think I will glue the plastic strip back on. The keys are held in place by the springs. You can pull them out. But it's easy to get them back in again. Part 1 accomplished. Now comes the more critical part. Will the glued brackets break again when I screw the keys back in? Everything looks and feels quite stable. First I need to attach these metal pieces to the brackets. That looks good. I think this will work. One of the brackets is a bit too thick at the top. The metal part doesn't fit. I will make it a little thinner with a rasp. Now I can put everything back. The slider contacts also need a bit cleaning with isopropanol alcohol. And they need a bit grease. That is also the only thing that keeps the small metal ball in place.
unfortunately, the connections are all still intact. And here we are. Everything is working fine, and if it wasn't for the crack, it would look almost like new. Well, there you have it. That's how I usually clean and repair my keyboards. There might be better ways to do it. And if you have any suggestions, leave me a comment. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching.